you have your Bibles, turn with me to Acts 21. Acts 21, and we will begin reading in verse 27. Let me give you the outline. Paul's arrest is the title of the sermon. Paul's arrest. Number one, the mob attacks Paul. The mob attacks Paul. If you remember back a couple of chapters, uh, uh, there was a guy named Agabus who predicted that this would happen. And he told Paul not to go to Jerusalem. But folks, I am telling you, and, and he was a prophet, and he was right in that. But he did not know God's will for Paul's life. Okay? And Paul turned towards Jerusalem, and this was God's will for his life. And I believe uh, it happened exactly the way God wanted it to happen. The mob attacks Paul. Two, the Roman soldiers arrest Paul. He will be arrested pretty much for the rest of the book of Acts. And number three, the commander questions Paul. The commander questions Paul. The scripture we're about to study marks a major transition in the life and ministry of the Apostle Paul. Paul had been able to speak freely and move about in many different countries, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and starting new churches. But from this point on, Paul would be a prisoner. He would even call himself an ambassador in chains in the book of Ephesians. From now on, Paul would testify and share the gospel with Roman officials. Paul wrote Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon during his imprisonment at Rome. Paul did not let his situation deter him from uh, sharing the gospel to Roman soldiers. Historians tell us Paul winning Roman soldiers to Jesus Christ while, he, while they were being chained to him. This is a valuable lesson we all need to learn. Even in the worst situations of life and the most challenging situations in life, we must continue to testify with our words and our actions about the goodness of God and His saving grace. So let's look at Paul's arrest and the mob attacks Paul. And you have to remember where we left off. It's been two weeks ago, uh, but the church at Jerusalem basically said, uh, Paul, and I will say this, I, I'm not sure I said it two weeks ago, but you know what the really cause of all that was? Paul had been in Gentile country, and they considered him unclean. And so they were wanting him, even though they said, you know, you don't have to do this, you know, they kind of pushed that and said, you need to do this. There, there's these four men are taking this Nazarene vow, Nazarite vow, and you need to be a part of that. And in part of that week's thing, on day three, he went to the temple, all right, part of that purification. On, and on day seven, he went to the temple also. And the seventh day is where all this took place. Look at verse 26. Then Paul took the men, and the next day, having been purified with them, entered the temple to announce the expiration of the day of purification at which time an offering should he, he be made to each one of them. And you realize that he also paid for their offering, okay? So they not only said, you need to go do this, you need to pay for it, all right? And again, I, I'm just saying, uh, he's a bigger man than I am, all right? Verse 27, now when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the crowd and laid hands on him. Now, these folks was the Judaizers, folks. These were folks from Ephesus. These were nemesis of his. These were enemies of his. These were the ones in the three years that he was ministering there just gave him grief. So they knew who Paul was. They knew what he was about. And this was their chance, okay? They were there for the Feast of Pentecost. There were thousands of Jews there. There were many people worshiping there. And a lot of them uh, were steeped in this Jewish tradition. And they riled up the crowd. It would remind us of the riot in Ephesus. And you knew how bad that got. And it, this, this is probably even more intense than that. And we think of laying on a hands is praying for somebody, but that is not what it means here, folks. All right, they took hold of him. They, uh, you know, uh, in their own mind, a mob uh, were after him. Later on, you will see where they beat him and that they kicked him. 
All right? And, and they were accusing him of four things. V verse 28, and crying out, men of Israel, help. And folks, you have to understand, mobs and, and these, these folks that attack, when a group of people attack one person, it is a coward act. It's cowards. I could not believe my eyes a few weeks ago when I saw a, a, a man attack a 65-year-old Asian person on the streets in front of a motel, and I watched as two of these door guys were looking and watching this happening, shuts the door and walks away. Folks, I think they should have arrested those two guys also. And it's just my personal opinion. You are going to let a 65-year-old person get beat like that. Folks, it is, the, it is the season in which we are living. People are going, I mean, all the time there's a shooting. You can't go to a grocery store and be safe. You can't go to Walmart and be safe anymore. And this mob, you know, mentality, if I don't like you, if I don't agree with you, I am going to hate you. And folks, our world is full of hate. It is pure hate. It is division. We are divided in so many ways. And I'm telling you, Satan is winning this battle. We are here to love people. We are here to encourage people. We are here to help people. And you may say, well, he could uh, pull out a gun and shoot you. But that's fine, folks. Are you going to threaten me with heaven? I refuse. I refuse to let that happen, folks. We need to do what Jesus would do. And it says, help. This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against the people of the law. So what is he saying? He's saying he does not like the Jewish customs. All right, which, folks, all four of these things was lie, 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 lie. There was no truth in these four accusations. He also talked to people and teaches against the law of Moses. Folks, I'm telling you, he was versed in the law of Moses. He knew the Old Testament. He knew. He was well-educated. That was the second thing. And brought them into this place. He was accused of bringing Gentiles into that part of the temple. And there is a wall before you get into that place where the Jews uh, are. And on that wall it says, any Gentile in entering in here will be put to death. So he would not take one of his buddy's friends and go in there. These people were lying big time on that. And he has defiled this holy place, which is a lie. Why? Because he just went through the purification process. He'd done what they asked him to do. But folks, people are going to lie on you. We are going to be persecuted. I hope you're getting ready mentally and spiritually for this, folks. The farther we go, the closer we get to the rapture of the church, it's going to cost you something spiritually and mentally and emotionally to serve our God. And people are going to falsely accuse you. Falsely accuse you. And it says in verse 29, For he has defiled this holy place, for they had previously seen Troiphimus, the Ephesian with him in the city, whom they supposed that Paul had brought to the temple. They just saw a Gentile friend of Paul's, but he was not in the temple with him. So it is a lie. And, and it says the word supposed, all right? And there's sometimes, folks, when somebody will say something to me, and here's my answer, I'm not even going to answer that question. If you do not know that from my life, in my walk with the Lord, I am not going to. Because here's the deal. Here's what you cannot control. What other people do. Folks, there are mean people out there. Mean. They're ugly. Satan whispers things into their ears. Satan discourages you. Satan has these acts from these people that don't know the Lord. I cannot control... And again, even in this case, Paul speaking about that was not going to change their mind. They'd already judged him. 
they were already taking things into their own hands there. And I'm telling you, it was wrong on all accounts. Verse 30, and all the city was disturbed, not just a few folks. And the people ran together and seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple and immediately shut the doors. What were they doing? They were shutting the doors so they could literally beat him to death. That was what they wanted to do. I find it interesting that when Stephen was stoned, there was a young man named Saul sitting there watching what was going on. Turn to Acts 7 with me. Turn to Acts 7. What did Stephen do in Acts 7? He just preached the gospel. What did he do? He just said, in front of the whole bunch of religious Folks, he just said, man, y'all are lost. Y'all are lost. You are the ones that have crucified Christ. And they could not take it. Listen, in verse 51, 751, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so did you. Which of the prophets uh, did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one who is Jesus, of whom now have become betrayers and murderers, and have received the law by directions of angels, and have not, uh, have not kept it. He's saying there are Old Testament scriptures that say this was going to take place, that persecution was coming, and God would send prophets to the children of Israel, and they'd listen to them for a while, and then they'd get tired of it, and they'd start serving idols and doing things totally against God, and the prophet would simply say, thus saith the Lord. Verse 54, and when they heard these things, they were cut to heart, all right? They were mad, they were angry, they gnashed at him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, folks, here's the deal. No matter what happens, you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. No matter how unfair a situation looks, do not go down to their level. Do not yell back. Do not be mean. Do not, you know, get angry at them. I'm telling you, that's exactly what they did to Jesus. At Jesus. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God in Jesus standing at the right hand of God. What did God do? God just opened up to heaven and said, Stephen, you're fixing to die. And you know what I call this? Dying grace. God was giving him the grace to get through this situation in life. And he said, look, I see the heavens open up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. What did he do? He went out preaching. He went out preaching the gospel. Then they cried with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran with him in one accord. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. See, that was probably what should have happened. But they were so angry with Paul, they didn't want to waste time going out beside the city. They were going to beat him to death in the Gentile part of the temple. And they cast him out and stoned him, and the witness laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Paul. Saul. See, Saul was lost when all that happened. Saul didn't know Christ. In chapter 9, it's where he gets saved. And folks, God took someone that allowed a, a stoning, allowed the death of a person. God forgave him of that sin and made him one of the greatest preachers, missionaries, church planners, men of God, disciples that ever walk the face of the earth do not tell me today you are too bad to be saved there's nobody out of the reach of god we just have to listen to the holy spirit we have to go through these situations with grace and with love and they stoned stephen as he was calling on god saying lord jesus receive my spirit and he knelt down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And then he fell asleep. It did not say he died. It said he fell asleep. What was Stephen doing? He was acting like Jesus. Let me ask you something this week. I know I'm going to hit close to home. 
I know I am. But was there a situation in life where you are not acting like Jesus this week? Well, folks, we need to look at our own lives. We need to look in the mirror in the most difficult situations of life. We need to reflect the life of Jesus. The second thing I want you to see, the mob attacks Paul. Look at verse 32. And immediately, uh, immediately took soldiers and centurions and took them and ran down to them. There was a garrison right at the corner of the temple where there was a sentry on top, and he saw all this happen. And because there were two uh, centurions there, a centurion was over 100 people, so 200 people were available quickly or they would have beaten Paul to death. And the Bible says, and when they saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. That's why I say, folks, we need to help those that can't help themselves. Verse 33, then they stopped beating Paul. Then the commander uh, came near to him and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains. And he asked who he was and what he had done. Do you not see the very thing that Agabus the prophet said earlier? He bound him between two soldiers. The very thing he predicted happened, which tells me this man was a true prophet of God and also that Paul was a man of God because he knew what was going to happen to him. He knew he was going to be arrested and he walked that road anyway. Folks, Jesus knew he was going to die. He was born to die. The cross had to happen. That sacrifice had to be made. And we just celebrated Easter. The greatest gift you got was not on your birthday. It was when you were saved. It was when Christ came into your life and paid for your sins and set you free. And the commander took him, verse 33, and he bound to him and asked what was done. And some of the multitude cried one thing and some another. So what happened? That riot started over again, even though there were soldiers everywhere. The riot started again. So when he could not ascertain the truth because of the torment, and folks, we're talking about chaos, mass chaos in this courtyard. He commanded him to be taken into the barracks. And when he reached the stairs, he had to be carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the mob. He couldn't walk in there chained and bound because people were attacking Paul. So they literally lifted him up and carried him in chains so they would not beat them to death. Folks, some people have no conscience. No conscience whatsoever. And you can see all this happen. It reminds me of what happened. And, and the parallels between Stephen and Jesus are just amazing in this Scripture. I mean, the parallels are there. Hold your finger there and go to Mark 15 with me. Mark 15. Mark 15, I want you to see this. Mark 15, verse 6. Now at the feast, he was accustomed to releasing one prisoner to them who they requested. And this is Pilate. And there was one named Barabbas who was chained with his fellow rebels. And they had committed murder in the rebellion. Then the multitude, crying aloud, began to ask him to do just as he had always done for them. See, Pilate had the coward way out. All right, he didn't want to make the decision. He put it back on them. Pilate could have kept Jesus from being sentenced, and I understand he was going to be sentenced anyway, but he literally washed his hand assuming that my, that my blood is not on this man. This is not my issue. All right? And folks, it's kind of like those two door folks, doormen. They just walked away and said, that's not my fight. That's not my problem. They washed their hands in the same way and it says, but Pilate answered to them, do you want me to re release to you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priests had handed him over because of envy. See, Pilate in his heart of hearts knew who Jesus was. Even Pilate in the conversation with his wife, 
She had divine uh, uh, insider information, folks. God had told her, listen, tell your husband don't have anything to do with this guy. This man is innocent. And the same thing was true of Paul. The four things he was accused of, he did none of them. None of them. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd so that the, he should rather release Barabbas to them. And pa Pilate answered and said unto them again, What then do you want me to do with him whom you call king of the Jews? Well, just notice his wording, whom you call. It's not my call. You're calling him that, all right? I find nothing wrong with him three times in Scripture. He said, I find nothing wrong with him. So they cried again, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, what evil has he done? And they cried all, out all the more, crucify him. So Pilate, wanting to gratify the crowd, released Barabbas to them, and he delivered Jesus after he had scourged him to be crucified. What had Barabbas done? He was accused of insurrection. What had Barabbas done? He was accused of murder. What did Barabbas do? Folks, if you're looking in the prison, he would have been on death row. So literally, as a slap in Jesus' face, they took the worst criminal and set them free. Folks, I'm telling you, you have to be prepared for seasons like this. Sometimes the people close to you or even closest to you will be the ones that hurt you the most. It hurts. It's wrong. They're lying. But you cannot be like them. We are called to rise above these things. Folks, I've been falsely accused in my days. As a youth minister, I was young in the faith. Young in the faith. And a girl accused me of touching her inappropriately and all I was doing was counseling her her and trying to help this girl and the mother went to the pastor of the church and said if you do not fire this guy I'm going to take it to the deacons and I'm going to get him fired the girl was lying 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 and for a week I'm telling you I wanted to quit the ministry it was my first job. It was my first ministry. And my preacher kept saying, the truth's going to come out. The truth's going to come out. The truth's going to come out. And the Monday before they were going to stand up in business meeting and do this, the girl confessed and said, I'm lying. Folks, it was one of the hardest things because you know what my flesh wanted to do? My flesh wanted to just throw in the towel and say, if this is ministry, I don't want anything to do with it. But you know, God kept telling me, stay true. Stay true. The truth is going to come out. And folks, what I'm saying, and I'm telling you that, because God is preparing you for the future when those things happen in your life. God tells us, uh, for all things work together, for good to those who love the Lord and are called according to the purpose. God tells us in 1 Corinthians, we go through these times in life so that we, be, can, we can become ministers to others. And folks, I'm telling you, Paul had done nothing wrong, but yet they wanted his life. The mob attacks Paul. The Roman soldiers arrest Paul. And the commander questions Paul. Look in verse 37. Then as Paul was about to be led into the barracks, he said to the commander, May I speak to you? And he replied, Can you speak in Greek? Are you not the Egyptian who some time ago stirred up a rebellion and led 4,000 assassins out into the wilderness? Even the commander listened to somebody else and it was false accusations. This literally happened earlier. Okay, there was... A, a, a renegade group. There was a coup trying to take over in the, the Roman government. But I'm telling you, uh, that, was, that was not done. Uh, the Romans uh, quelched that, and the Romans uh, killed part of this group. 
And, and these guys, these folks went so far as to say that was the leader right there. He escaped before. And they were blaming Paul for this. And this commander didn't know any different. He didn't know who Paul was or what he was about. Verse 39, but Paul said, I am a Jew from Tarsus in Sicily and citizen of no city. I implore you, permit me to speak to these people. So when he had given him permission, Paul stood as he had given him permission and stood on the stairs and motioned with his hands to the people. And when there was great silence, he spoke to them in Hebrew and in his language. See, the commander figured out this was, he wasn't this Egyptian renegade. Why? Because he spoke Greek. And he also spoke Hebrew. I'm telling you, he was an educated man, very educated. All right, criminals just aren't that way. Okay, so folks, if somebody lies on you, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what someone else thinks, folks. It really doesn't. All that matters is what I know and what God knows. Folks, God knows every situation you're in. God knows everything that happens in your life. God allows these things to happen to make you stronger, to teach you, and to, to be able to be like Jesus. What if we just never had a problem in life? What if nothing ever went wrong? What if we could always pay our bill and we was always just, you know, always just, you know, not necessarily happy, but just nothing ever went wrong? Folks, we would be spoiled brats is what we would be. But we have Christ in our life. We have the Holy Spirit in our life. We have a God looking down over us, knowing what the situation is. And do you know what? A lot of times the thing that God is trying to teach you, patience. I believe of the nine fruits of the Spirit, patience is the last one we master as Christians. Because most of the time, we have things under control. We are the ones spinning the plates. We are the ones moving things around on the board of life. But every once in a while, God just sets back, He allows things to happen, and He observes you. He sees how strong you are. You are. I heard a preacher say one time, God gives his most, the, the hardest test to his most loyal soldiers. Why? Because you can trust those soldiers. You can trust them. Mark 15. Mark 15. Look at this. Mark 15, verse 1. Talking about Jesus. Mark 15, verse 1. And immediately in the morning, the chief priest held the consolation with the elders and the scribes and the whole council. And they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, are you king of the Jews? Pilate knew the answer to that question. And he answered and said, it is as you say. And the chief priest accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. Folks, I have learned to discern things. And when somebody's already made their decision, our conversation is over. See, a lot of people don't want a dialogue. A lot of people don't want to talk. You know what they want to do? They want to send you a text. Why? Because they don't have to face you. They want to send you a nasty email. Why? Because they don't want to face you. All right? When they get to that point, that's when I say, We'll continue this conversation when you can come in and we can talk. You bring your one witness, I'll bring my one witness. And guess who my one witness is? He's sitting right there. We've been together for 10 years and he knows me. And let's sit down in a room and let's talk. Let's talk like civil Christians. Let's get this thing worked out. Get it worked out. Pilate knew the answer, but Jesus said nothing. Why? Because he knew it wasn't going to change anything. And you know the crazy thing about this whole thing? That person who's being ugly to you is sitting in his bed sleeping like a baby, and you're up at night wondering why this person has done this to you. 
You are the one losing sleep. You know what the Bible says about worry? Let me help you here. It's a sin. See, we don't want to say that. Ooh, I don't like that. Take it up with God, folks. Matthew says it. Matthew says it's a sin. Why are you worried about that? Why do you care what that person thinks? Okay? You know the truth. They don't want to face the truth. Verse 4, then Pilate asked him again, saying, do you answer nothing? seeing how the things they testify against you. But Jesus still answered nothing. So Pilate marveled. Pilate thought, well, maybe he's not who he says he is. Because here's the deal, folks. Jesus could have won that argument. <laughs> Jesus could have cured, you know, cleared that courtroom. Jesus could have come off the cross. He could have. But he stayed there. Why? Because of love. Because of love. Folks, we're not going to win people over by being ugly and nasty and rude and like them. We're not going to. And again, I'm not telling you to be a doormat. I'm not. Just here's what I'm telling you. Just be like Jesus. Just be like Jesus. Matthew 10. Two more scriptures and we're done. Matthew 10. Jesus warned them. Verse 16. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of the wolves. That's not a good thing, all right? Folks, we have wolves. We, there are wolves running around in our churches. Okay? Pastors. I'm just telling you, watch who you watch on TV. If they don't line up with the Word of God, turn it off. They are not the exception to God's rule. Not. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But be aware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils and scourge you in the synagogues. That's exactly what was going on. You will be brought before governors and kings, and for my name's sake, as a testimony to the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, do not worry. Who? there it is. Do not worry about how or what you should speak. For it will be given to you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of the Father who speaks in you. Folks, if you take it into your own hands, then it's your problem. If you give it to God, it's yours and God's problem. And He will give you the words to say. We're out of times, but Proverbs chapter 15, it says, a soft answer, a soft response will quell anger. Will quell anger. Folks, when somebody gets angry and they're mad at you, I'm just telling you, just let them, let them be. Let them be. And folks, I am telling you, Paul, Paul did what Jesus did. Paul was just getting ready, and, and it's going to be next week, folks. He has the opportunity to witness the gospel of Jesus Christ to literally the whole mob. And folks, if we lose our temper, then we lose our testimony. And I pray it not be so. Father, thank you for the day. And God, it's, it's tough, man. It's, it's where we live today. It's where we live. And God, I, I know all of us have gotten angry at one time. All of us have not been nice at one time. And God, I, I, I know, I know I have. And God, I pray that we would just cry out to you. Lord, for wisdom, most of all, we need wisdom to react to everything life tosses us. God, it's hard. I'm not going to sit here and say it's easy. But I will sit here and say it's right. God, I pray that we would just do the right thing. Do the right thing in all situations of life and let all the rest go. God, I pray we would quit losing sleep overnight, especially over mean people. God, it's just not worth it. God, give us that peace that passes all understanding. God, if there's one here that doesn't know you, God, I pray that they would just come to you today. They can find that peace. They can find that, that patience and, and the goodness and the kindness and the tender heart, uh, Lord, that you give them in Christ. So God, if others need to come for baptism or even for church membership, God, I pray that you would just speak to them this day 
In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come? We thank you for joining us this morning at Rye Hill Baptist Church, and may God richly bless you.